one of the things that I'd like to discuss is what's going on in the Clear Lake area okay. um, as far as upcoming developments. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I, the other day I was talking to an investor group that's coming in next Thursday and they're not in the Clear Lake area but I've known them for a long time and they said I want to know what you're involved in because we have, in, we have investors that want to put money in deals all over mm -hmm. the place. I started tabulating everything that's going on and my rough on the napkin estimate was about a, easily a billion dollars of development happening in, mm -hmm. in the Clear Lake area. When you say Clear Lake, Webster, League City, what, what all goes into I'd that? I'd start with Webster and go all the way down to the island. Okay. Um, that's, that's actually, I stopped at Webster Texas City. Webster to the causeway? I, stepped at, I stopped at Texas City. Okay. So let's just say Texas City up to Webster, the Bay border. Area. Yeah, Bay, the, yeah, yeah, Bay Area. So, okay, you start with uh, Great Wolf Lodge. Uh, that is 50-acre water park entertainment. You've got next to that, just south of it, 120 acres called Flyway. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a massive mixed-use development. Mm -hmm. um, just north of that, actually, is the, they're finishing up the HEB. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of land on the front mm -hmm. that they're now developing as well. Then you go start going south, cross over the, cr the creek, Clear Creek, you've got a 70-acre deal called, project called Riverview at Clear Creek, right where La Brisa is. Yep, right behind it. Yeah, they've got the one apartment property now. They're going to mm -hmm. do a sister property. Mm -hmm. They're going to put an Aloft hotel, a marina, all sorts of other things. The city's given them $14 million in incentives mm. for that uh, over a seven-year period. It's a long build-out. Yeah. So you've got that. You start going south of that. Tesla, your favorite brand, yep. just announced they're taking over the old BMW dealership. Are you, are you kidding me? Oh, no. Oh. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. Strangely, the only thing that doesn't cut is the cameras at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Here, hold on. I mean, that's got to be a, I don't want to trip over this wire. That's got to be a whole building. I would think so. Yeah, we're on generators. Oh, I've got a flashlight on the phone. Oh, oh there okay. we go. Emergency okay. generator kicked in. Did it did we start at the very beginning? Or? No, cameras don't cut out. So if I was you, I would just say... Tell, I'll start with Tesla. Yeah, go a little bit further down, and then <clears throat> that's what I would do. Okay. So the old BMW dealership just north of 518 on I-45, that is going to be retrofitted for Tesla. So mm -hmm. they're coming in. So what was unsightly that BMW, they moved to the Clear Lake area, up off 45, the further up in the Clear Lake area. So you got Tesla going in there. Just ne next to that, to the south, is Grand Oak Village. Mm -hmm. And that is a 16-acre development mm -hmm. that I'm involved in. And it is uh, seven different tracts of land. Uh, one of them, the first tenant's about to open in a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. We've got That's other- Pet Suites, right? Pet Suites, yeah. they open in a couple of weeks. We've got other pads under development, and um, rumor has it the warehouse is just south, maybe bought, and they may be mm -hmm. um, repurposed. Repurposed. Yep. <clears throat> over the that's kind of a nice source, so I think that'd be, I think that would be a welcome change yeah. for the people that live in the area. Um, I think so. so just to go back when you talked about Tesla, I uh, just sold mine because I got tired of driving to the service center. You're kidding? No. Really? Wow. So I guess maybe I'll have to repurchase it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Every time something was wrong with it, uh, they used to do a lot of uh, mobile service for my vehicle. But as, as soon as I got the new one, everything had to be done at the service center. See, I thought they it's did really a lot far. Of, I thought they did a lot of online updates. They do, but anytime you had like uh, um, replace the windshield wiper, or I need a new tire, or I got to fix this camera, on the older model it was all done remotely. Like they would come to my office, fix it in the parking lot. Um, but with this newer model, everything had to go back to the service center. It's all the way off Westheimer. Ooh, so wow. I was like, ah, I'm done with this. Like whenever something's more convenient, maybe I can return to this brand. But for now, I'm out. Yeah. So that's nice to know. Yeah. So Untimely for me. But yeah, really. <laughs> maybe I can come back around uh, uh, later because I really enjoyed the car. I just didn't like going so far for for service. Yeah. And then, you know, Grand Oak, uh, I am 
probably three sets of drawings away from turning in permits. Oh, good. To try to start construction in that same. In I that intentionally same didn't mention it because I didn't know if it was a secret still. Yeah, you know, by the time this comes out, <laughs> nothing's a secret. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're excited to be in there. We're excited to have to just own something. You know, uh, commercial real estate is something that you're very versed in. But you know, for me, it's first run mm -hmm. at something, so I'm learning a lot about you know drawings and yeah, yeah. What the hell? <laughs> They've got to be messing with something. You know, the, I, I wonder if there's a storm out there. I think it started raining. Oh, it is starting to storm. That's true. Let me see what my weather options. It was raining when I was uh, sitting in the lobby. Carly, did you do this? Yeah. The weather channel radar is the most accurate. Oh, yeah, it's uh, red right now. So the good news is all, <coughs> all of my computer equipment's on battery backups. Love it. That's so I've good. got like six hours when it loses so that we can all go in and save. That's save. great. Six yeah. hours is... Because uh, the yeah. servers, well, that way if I'm like home and it happens, yeah. I have time, I can get up here yeah. and save everything on the server before it just goes... That's more than most people are doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So with Grand Oak, you know, learning, you know, we're about to get to permitting and just learning that process. I have a great under, I have a, I have a better understanding and respect for what you got, you, what you do, because you, you uh, deal with commercial development a lot. Yeah. But I can see it, you know, I can see that things are, are picking up and growing. And one of the things I'd like to ask you about is, you know, with me building a building, I'm paying close attention to raw material prices. Mm -hmm. Now I am starting to see that they're coming down. Mm -hmm. Are you start? Has it made it to developers yet? Has the have has the raw material price reductions? Because we're 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 going to talk about you know inflation and we're going to talk about supply chains or whatever we're going to talk about today. When I see lumber go from fourteen hundred to five hundred, mm -hmm. are we seeing that yet? From a developer standpoint, are you seeing cheaper lumber? Are you seeing cheaper cold rolled steel? Those I beams should start to come down. We're 20, 30 percent off their highs. Are we seeing it yet? I think, uh, yeah, I, I equate it to when you hear oil prices have gone down. Mm -hmm. You see them go down, and you rush over to get gas, and you're like, you're looking at it and go, wait a minute, yeah. it didn't reduce. Yeah, it's that all that oil's already in the batch to be refined, yep. so it's got to get out before you start seeing it go down. Yeah. Similar to um, the prices lumber you mentioned is of all of them my understanding is that's the one that's come down the most yep when covid started it was 350 400 dollars per thousand board foot it launched up to 1600 and now like you said it's i think under 500 right now yeah i watched it because it got up to 1600 and then there was a small dip where it went down to about 600 november of last year 2021 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then by March, it was back to 1,400 for 1,000 feet. Now it's it's dipped under 500 a couple times. I think today it's about 520. Yeah, I saw it dip under 500. But are too. we starting to see that? At uh, the actual a little bit. Material? I think what I think is going to happen is that um, you've got, and we'll hit this. We'll talk about interest rates in a minute. But as r interest rates are going up and people decide to pause mm -hmm. new projects, it's going to free up those supply chains. Yep. And then that whole, it's all supply and demand, right? Mm -hmm. So the demand will shrink, so the supply will get better. Yep. So then prices so will then come, come down. down. So then one thing that I think a lot of people don't hone in on is it's, it's a United States, actually a world issue on the supply chains, but a lot of developments in the north, when it gets very cold, they don't develop as much as we do right. down prices here. Prices drop. So there's that too. Yeah. So I, I think we are going to get more. Seasonal price relief. drop seasonal price drop so i think we're going to see more right now i don't feel like it's made it all the way through just mm -hmm. yet but i i do believe it's around the corner it's not going to be massive but mm -hmm. i think it is going to start coming down somewhat well, so take for instance what i'm trying to do right now is i'm trying to sprint to shovel ready mm -hmm. i'm just trying to sprint to shovel ready so that can i get to shovel ready by the time it does come because we're going to get some relief, right, maybe in the winter. Mm -hmm. Can I get the shovel ready by the time it's winter so I can close on my construction loan and get a decent price? Mm -hmm. uh, because my, just my building went up 
65 percent. 65 percent. Construction wow. costs. <clears throat> yeah. From November 2020 to March 21. Well, if it um, makes you feel any better, put yourself in the shoes of someone who's building something to lease out and you've already pre-leased everybody. Oh, yeah. You can't go to them and say, nope. hey, rents went up. Do you mind paying $30 a foot instead of 25 Just kidding. I need you to pay <laughs> yeah. this now. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the worst spot to be in. I mean, we're going to owner occupy the whole building, but, uh, you know, expecting to pay one thing and having to pay 65% more is tough to stomach. Yeah. So even if we can get that down to 40% more, that's a win for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to pay higher, higher rates on it. Right. Right. You get a double whammy. You got to increase costs and higher rates. Yeah. And at first it wasn't, but now that Fed's pushing, right? Mm -hmm. If I don't get some relief on price point, I do get the double whammy. Mm -hmm. So if I can get a little bit material cost break um, to bring the overall budget down and I pay the, pay the higher rate, I'm probably still paying the same as if I would have built it in March. Well, and if you, uh, if you're, uh, uh, if it's available to you to re-engineer a little bit, mm -hmm. maybe use some different materials, yep. a little bit more lumber, a little bit less yep. steel, whatever. I think lumber's can... come down enough to where you have to at least look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the main thing, of course, down here is hurricane-proof. It makes sure yep. it's still, you know, as solid as you need it to be. But mm -hmm. yeah, we, I mean, we've looked at, at re-engineering a few. We, we had a, uh, a daycare we were. Um, we're trying to work to put on our northern lot at Grand Oak Village. And um, I went back to him, I said, it's not doable anymore. I had an out clause. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna build it, they're gonna lease it. Mm -hmm. And I went back to him and I said, it's, it's not feasible anymore. The numbers, we lose money yeah, on no this Yeah, no feasibility. Deal. And they said, hold on, we really wanna be in Lake City. Let's work with you. Uh, let's do a different design, a different layout. And you can use different building materials as long as it's still got that look, and it's the same look for you know our development, mm -hmm. you know in general. So, yeah, we're trying to work with them, and I've increased their rent, and they've been okay with that, which tells you they had a great deal in the first place. They're like, yeah, we can raise our rent. Well, I think everybody's deal in 2020 sounds really good today. Oh yeah, right. I I was looking up something yesterday uh, on interest rates. Mm. And um, I saw an article that said, yeah, it's great to have rates at 3% or whatever. And, you know, you just realize it wasn't that long ago, all these wonderful things with rates and construction costs were going on. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was so easy to, I mean, the access, it, everybody was, wants money at 3%. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. So, I mean, what do you expect? You expect huge growth. Because yeah. people that have money, expansion is so much cheaper uh, until materials get crazy. Right. Because then you buy up everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, fast forward to today, everyone's battling inflation. Is the right thing to do to pump a few more hundred billion of dollars into the economy? Well, you know, and the, 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 the Fed doesn't think so. I mean, as far as, you know, their, their whole strategy of... of um, I'm not putting so much cash mm -hmm. into the economy. Um, you know, their their whole point, supposedly, is to keep us out of recession. Yeah. You know, and, and keep the economy thriving. And you know, they do it through buying and selling securities mm -hmm. and through changing the Fed funds rate. Mm -hmm. And um, my my concern. Um, not a judgment against the Fed, but my my concern, like everybody's, is they raise rates so much that we do have a recession. And uh, well, that's what happened in 2019. What's that? That's what happened in 2019. Yeah, we were going to go into a recession without COVID. Mm -hmm. Like they had re they had raised the rate to a point of resistance, right? Uh, conventional mortgages top five for the first time in a long time, mm -hmm. and that was the resistance point. Everybody was like, mm, things were starting to slow a little bit. And uh, COVID, you know, quote unquote, it was a terrible thing. Um, and I wish we didn't have it, but what it ended up doing with Fed rates and everything else and bailouts and rescues and all of the things that they tried to do to keep things turning is it created this just explosion. Right. For the real estate world, at least. Mm -hmm. other, in, other industries, not so much, right? Um, but without absent COVID happening, we were going into something. 
end yeah. of 2019. Uh, and only four or five months later, COVID happens, and then, you know, we have this delayed response. But I think the Fed's the biggest knock I have on the Fed, and look, I don't want to play armchair quarterback, but they're slow to act. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to raise it as it grows. Not yeah, wait, not in 100 basis points. Not wait chunks. until infl- inflation's run away and mm-hmm. then go 100 basis points, right? Yeah. When you call 5% inflation transitory, you're wrong. doesn't matter what kind of economist you are. Mm-hmm. 5% is not transitory. Yeah. We know that. Uh, and, and those numbers are behind. Mm-hmm. Right. They're, so they're likely to be worse. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Americans see it at the pump. They see it at the grocery store. They know that it's bad, you know? Well, and, and it's funny, the, the two things you just mentioned at the pump and at the grocery store, that's you know, the, the biggest, probably the two biggest items that are measured in inflation, yeah. you know? And I look at it as sort of a COVID-related inflation to a degree. I mean, um, when COVID ended, the pent-up demand just got unleashed. Yeah, 100%. You know, and when prices you make, rise. Well, you made money super cheap. You made access it, to it super easy, and then you pumped a bunch of it into the market. Mm-hmm. So everybody had money to spend, pent up um, consumer demand, mm-hmm. um, consumer confidence is high because everything's cheap. Everybody's just trying to get money in, and mm-hmm. we had just pumped four trillion of it in to the economy. So this was always going to happen, mm-hmm. based on what actions were taken. This was always going to happen. Yeah. Now, is the right thing to do to completely try to keep us out of a recession? A rece- I, I don't think a recession has to be a bad thing. I don't. I just think that you can't have uh, $5 eggs forever mm-hmm. because we know that wages don't go at the same rate. Um, wages are higher, but they're not on par with inflation higher. Yeah, they're not eight and, and a half, nine And I'm not ready to take a victory lap on inflation yet because when you pull out core goods and gasoline, core goods and oil, it actually still went up on this last report. Right. If you take those two big things and fuel was 80% of the reduction, mm-hmm. there's a lot of reasons to use less fuel, right? Yeah. You mentioned seasonal, right? When we go into the fall, we're going to use less fuel. Mm-hmm. We don't have to cool our homes as much. All those things factor into fuel charges. So, you know, but when people are having 100% increases on their energy bill, that hurts. Yeah. When they can't fill their gas tank, that hurts. Mm-hmm. And now we're starting to see a little bit of unemployment. So it'll be interesting. But I'm not, I, I think when you strip out those core goods and, and, and oil and the numbers still went up, I, it makes me not ready to take a victory lap yet. I don't know that we're out. Yeah, and I, I think that um, you've got, you also had the surge and all because of the whole, the war. Sure. You know, so you've, you've, you've got these things that aren't normally in the economy that mm-hmm. have happened, COVID and the war. Yep. Ukraine not being able to ship wheat. You know, it's not like they're the biggest player, but they're, you know, something. Five, it, count, it matters when the whole world has a 90-day food supply. Yeah, yeah. So you've got those factors. You've also got uh, the infrastructure bill. All of a sudden, the government now is building stuff. They're mm-hmm. competing for those goods. So you all They've those They've got things, more money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about recession. That's on everybody's mind. But I don't think it's just recession or not recession, it's what type of recession, mm-hmm. how deep of a recession. Uh, there's no way in the world it'll be the great recession, but no. maybe the quote soft recession, mm-hmm. or so, it just de- kind of depends on what happens. But if we, if our inflation goes from, if my numbers are right, went from like 9.1 to 8.6 or something, um, the, just recently, we still got a long way to go to get to two. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, everybody is, so for interest rates, right? So the Fed's not buying mortgage-backed securities at the level that they are, and they're wanting to sell off their balance sheet, Mm -hmm. which creates no liquidity for mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. So um, for someone that sells servicing, there's no premium, Mm -hmm. right? 
So that causes an issue for rates to continue to go up. And then if there's no premium and there's no liquidity and we know that the Fed's going to be aggressive in raising rates, we don't know where to price loans. Hmm. Because my 4% loan that I sold in March is worth negative 2% now. Hmm. I'm yeah. losing money on the servicing of that loan, so we don't know where to price it. So that's why you're seeing the yo-yo, because if we think the Fed's going to go 100 basis points, we've got to raise rates half a point. Right. And then if they go less, then you start to see us sell some of that back. You'll start to see that 10-year sell-off, because now we know it's not 100, it's 50. Or we know it's not 100, it's 75. Mm -hmm. so you get that temporary reprieve until we get the next set of huge economic numbers, which is why you keep seeing rates go like this, because no one knows where the liquidity is going to be. No one knows where the right place to buy mortgage-backed securities are right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and they flood in and out of the bond market like they're stocks. Right. Because everything's going up and down all the time. Mm -hmm. So that part, you know, when you look at ceilings and floors of resistance for mortgage-backed securities, it was this wide. And in the last 60 days, we've got it to something that feels manageable, but the so the support floor, there's nothing there. If we break out higher on 10-year treasury mortgage-backed securities, there's no, there's really nothing to stop it. Hmm. Yeah. There's That's... nothing to stop it from continuing to go. So I called six and a half would be the high. I still think we have a chance to get there. Six and a half on, on actual, on lo like residential loans? Mm -hmm. I called that would be the high. We got to 583. I think... Uh, and you're now what, low fives? Yeah, low fives, high fours. I think that if we didn't... I think that if it's not really cooled as much as I thought, if you take the gasoline and everything out and core goods and everything else continues to go up while those two things go down, um, the Fed is going to get aggressive. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. Let me ask you a question. So I think a common... Um, a misunderstanding of, of people is that when the Fed raises rates that they just raised exactly mm -hmm. 50 basis points on your mortgage, yeah. which, you know, it's not true. It, it's not true. It, maybe it kind of runs in a parallel, mm -hmm. like, because it's more so. It takes so, a while to get to the longer term loans. Yeah. Like credit cards, everything else, super quick, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it takes a while to get to 30-year mortgages. But at the same time, those two and 10-year treasuries are still trading off of Fed speculation. Mm -hmm. So if we think they're going to do it, they'll start to trade higher. They've got to have more yield. They've got to have more yield to invest in that. We had one of the worst 10-year um, treasury auctions in the last 18 months. This last one was terrible. It opened up almost no bid. Really? Yeah. Hmm. For 10-year treasury. Now, eventually it found a place and it sold off and it was what it was, it was what it was, but you know, when mortgage-backed securities get to a point to where they're no bid, then what do you do? Right. Where do you price them? Yeah. 7%? Hmm. That's, uh, it, it's interesting to hear where you're, where you sit and where I sit. I'll tell you what happens from my standpoint, if I'm going to develop mm -hmm. in this environment, develop, interest rates on development are virtually always try to, tied to prime. Yes. So when I see prime went up 50 basis points, I literally know tomorrow mm -hmm. my, my, my bank statement or my loan statement will change. That will change. And I get my notice like in, in the mail the next week, your new rate is, is X. Mm -hmm. It's the same way. We have a, uh, I have a, a line of credit for um, flips, and it's the same way. Yeah. I can log in the next day. It's half a point higher. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're on it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the gas console. goes up that fast, too, right? It takes forever to come down. Oh, yeah. But it's the same thing. Oil trades higher today. The gas that's in the ground goes up. It's almost like you can be like an arbitrage. Sure. You yeah. know, and just play that little Yeah. I mean, they get to spread. They get to move the levers, not us. But yeah, you, you, it helps to know how to play the game. And right now, I think the hardest thing for people to figure out is how do I play? Well, and I'll give you a great example. So we have a loan on on our project, and nothing has changed. We still own all the, the same dirt that we owned three months ago, and our monthly in interest-only payment, our interest-only payment was $12,000 a mm -hmm. month. 
and now it's 16,000. Yeah. And we did, and nothing else changed other than interest rates. And it's, uh, you know, and then when you have partners in your deal and you tell them, today I'm capital calling you, but I won't capital call you again for six months. And then three months later you say, oops, I'm capital calling Just you. Just kidding. Yeah. And they say, well, wait, what happened? And I'll say, here's the statement. Yeah, this this is what happened. Yeah. And it's, well, sell the pads or develop them, develop them quicker. Well, I may not be able to develop them as quick because it might be a little harder to get money, or they may not be rates you want, mm -hmm. and there might not be somebody on the other side to buy that pad right now. What I find from the commercial standpoint, in an environment like this where costs are up and rates are up, and it's not so easy to just change rents on your investment building, mm -hmm. you hope that a single user like yourself is the one buying. Yeah. You Cause because I've got to absorb it no matter what, right? You're gonna absorb it no matter what, and you probably can't pass it down. No. But you're in for the long haul. You're there for twenty years yeah. or whatever. Whereas the investor guy is building a building and a lot of times three years later, five years later, they're gonna sell it mm -hmm. and they gotta sell it into the market. Um, but while they're holding it, if you had factored in 5% interest and $28 a foot rents mm -hmm. and your cost of X and you run that model, it's just a Excel sh sheet on steroids. Plug in this and it changes that and you come down, you go 8% cash on cash yield. I can sell that all day long. And then the rates just went up, oops, 6.8% cash and on cash. At two, eight, and you're still at 28 a foot. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if the pre-lease is done, can't go knock on his door and go, hey, do you mind 29 a foot? Yeah. You know, you know, there's, that's your problem. So let me give you just what I, what I think is just a chaotic thought, but I think that it is true. And, you know, us being in different years of experience, I think that part of the problem is, is our, our economy is not built to be a speedboat. Our economy is a, is a tanker. It doesn't just turn mm -hmm. on a dime, but we live in a, a world of I want it. I want. I need it. I need just the results four se in four seconds. Yeah. I need results in four seconds. Why can't you just fix it? Mm -hmm. And nothing works that way. As a matter of fact, the faster our economy moves, the worse it is. We're not. There's no. There's no safety nets. There's no. You know, uh, rates go up. There's no liquidity. No one knows what to bid. We don't know where to price. Um, steady growth is the way that our economy is built for. We're not built for this. And I don't know if that means that. We have to retool how it works, you know, all the way back from, you know, 1776 or whatever. We got to retool how this incredible GDP works, or do we have to have people understand that, like, look, I understand that we're in a instant gratification society, but we have to understand that the global economy and the economy of our country doesn't move that way, because when rates go down super fast, it's it's troublesome for guys like me too. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, it, we can get millions of dollars in margin call in 24 hours. Cause you have just a big warehouse line of credit or well, something. So what happens is, is let's say I tell Fannie Mae, I'm going to sell you a hundred million dollars in servicing at 5%, right? So they do all their stuff on the back end. I'm going to get this group of loans at 5% and then rates go to three. Mm. They want that difference until you deliver the loans at 3%. Oh, wow. Hmm. They want it now. Hmm. It's like a margin call. It is a margin call. That's exactly what it is. So that's what happens when things go down quickly. And then if they go up quickly, we don't know where to price. No one knows what the value of servicing is because I don't know if tomorrow it's going to be eight or if tomorrow it's going to be five. So where do I, where, <coughs> what is the value of that servicing? If I don't keep it for X time, I don't make my money back anyway, I'm going to get an early payoff. If I get an early right. payoff, that's, that's not profitable. So that's why you see rates go up super quick. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, right, when you said that about do we retool and, and how you know, things happen so quick. I just had a flashback, and I remembered before the Internet, I mean, before the, mm -hmm. you know, the proliferation of it, let's say, um, <clears throat> I remember... Uh, 
in my young career, I'd started putting money in my 401k. And every quarter I'd get my statement. And every day I'd check the mail and I'd think, man, how long is it gonna take for me to get my quarterly statement? Mm -hmm. Well, now people literally are online checking their stock every single day. Sure. And if it went down that one day, wow, should I sell? Yeah. My Tesla stock went down, I, maybe I ought to sell. It's, we've become day traders in our mind. Yeah, I mean, it, I, call, I like to call it a Robin Hood society. Like everybody has a Robin Hood account. They can trade anything at any time. And if they make $50 today, they want to sell it. Yeah. And that's not how our economy was built. Our yeah. economy was not built for 19-year-old investors being able to put $150 in and out of a market in four seconds. Right. Not built for that. Well, remember... But that's what we're in now. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, I think it was when the dot-com crash happened, I think it was in 2001, mm -hmm. leading up to that, I mean, if, if you went out and created a company called Steve.com, you'd get money. Yes. Somebody would pour money into your yep. half-witted idea. Yeah, just because it's on the internet. Because it's on the internet. Yeah. And, but Warren Buffett sat there on the sidelines, said, nope, I'm investing in McDonald's and Ford, things I can touch, things I can see. I don't care about Fred.com. He, he also likes really, he likes dividend stocks too. Yeah. And tech companies at the time were not dividend paying. And uh, yeah, exactly. Well, and they're not. They don't even have any money to pay it because right. they're all losing so well, much. Well, they're all. They all. They all make billionaires and no profit. Yes, exactly. So Buffett's sitting here going. Everyone is looking at him going. You're so old and so out of touch. Just grandpa, sit over there on the sidelines while we make some money in the tech yep. world. And then, boom! It just crashed. Um, I mean, I, I remember. I had an account with. Merrill Lynch, mm -hmm. not a lot in it, and but the broker, uh, my broker Steve coincidentally was his name. Steve said, uh, "I am allowed to sell up to a hundred shares of stock to any one of my clients on these uh, IPOs," mm -hmm. and it was just because Merrill is probably brokering the. IPO. They were probably underwriting the yeah. whole security or something. Yeah. And so he and they typically, for whatever reason, they'd come out at like fifteen bucks a share, yeah, something like that. So I'd, I'd get, uh, he would, I'd pay him fifteen hundred dollars, and it would go public. I remember one day there was a stock, and he told me, "I'm going to get get you a hundred hundred shares of this." And I was at work, and at nine a.m. it went public, and at eleven a.m. he called me. And he said, hey, I just want to let you know, I tried to get, reach you earlier, but you were in a meeting or something. And, um, but I, I sold that stock. I said, you mean the one that went public at nine? And he said, yeah. He said, I got you in at $1,800 and I sold it for 11,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's trading at 87 a share. I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. I said, you've got to be kidding me. So we went and put a down payment on a car. Yeah. You know, and it was ludicrous. We had um, Penny, you know, my wife had, was in this Bunko group, and the lady was, uh, always showed up, and, and, her, and her, she always talked about her s uh, husband who was in sales in IT. And uh, one day she came in with a case of Dom Perignon for the Bunko group, started opening up the bottles, and she said, I'm celebrating. Yeah. My husband w got shares, mm -hmm. and he is now worth, worth $100 million. Yeah. <laughs> and she goes, oh, by the way, I'm leaving the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. I'll still come uh, play Bunko with you, though. <laughs> yeah. can, I'll host. Yeah, really. Yeah. That's so it's, but I, I, I agree. I think there, there, there's, there's no way in the world right now that you can put the horse back in the barn and tell people, just be patient. You know, don't be day, day traders. That, that horse is out of the barn. But maybe there's, somehow you can adapt I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure that out, but I don't know. I think maybe you have um, an idea would be to have a different exchange for high volume daily stocks. Hmm. Well, do people, everyone's become do people day trade GE? Probably not. Doubt it. They probably do. Some people like to day trade Ford because now they're in electric, right? Yeah. So now it's tech. Yeah. But they don't day tra they don't day trade GE. They don't day trade 3M. They don't day trade Coke, um, those are dividend stocks. You're gonna make 
Walmart. Your blue chips, they can stay where they are. But maybe there's room for a new exchange hmm. for yeah. these, you know, run an algorithm and say, hey, these 100 stocks are going to make up this new exchange hmm. because these are the ones that are just high volume, you know, 19 to 35 year olds are trading this through Robinhood, whatever it is. Maybe that's the answer. Kind of like what when NASDAQ came out, yeah. kind of what they were. Yeah. Yeah. But the comp, you know, what it's compromised of is indicative of the times. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, if you want to continue to trade Dow, trade Dow. Uh, but if you want to be in this, it's on this exchange. And there's a, there's a, there's a hyper segment of it that everybody understands. Because, <coughs> like you said, you can't just stop the ship, mm -hmm. you know, but maybe there can be, you know, an arm that makes sense. That yeah. we can try to be, like, we don't have to be predictable here because we know it's not. Right. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I just think it's interesting. I think that in times like this, innovation is what wins. And I think crazy ideas make more sense. Well, you know, historically, there's always been people that have tried to work the market, you know, be a day trader or whatever. Mm -hmm. For, coincidentally, last night I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine. And I said, do you remember that guy, Carl Icahn? I said, yeah. He would go and buy up stock just under the SEC radar mm -hmm. until you have 10% ownership. Yeah. You don't have to report it. Yeah. And then at about 9%, he'd launch you know, a big um, takeover. Yep. Um, and he'd pick a, a GE or whoever. And they'd, they would put in play their you know, poison pill or mm -hmm. whatever they would do. Get their, and then board, they start get their board seat, all this other stuff. Yeah. yeah. Then they start negotiating with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, the stock was at 10, you made an offer at 20. We want you to go away. Um, can we write you a check for a billion dollars or mm -hmm. 500 million? He said, yeah. He wouldn't say it, but yeah, that's all I wanted anyway, is to just play with your yeah. stock. I think he did. I think he ended up making a play on Apple, made a ton of money. But I, that's, what it, that's, what the te that's what the Twitter deal felt like in the beginning. Yeah, that's yeah. what it felt like in the beginning. But I think he truly does want to own it. I just think he wants to own the correct version of it. Right, his, his version. He wants to own the, the valued of correct accounts. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe he wants out, I don't know, who knows? He's got plenty of money. But yeah. that's what it felt like at first, because it was like 14% just hanging out. Then it was like, I'm on the board. Then it was like, never mind, I wanna buy it. Yeah. And I'll make you an offer at 30% premium. Right. For a company that's never made money. Huh. Yeah. Never one time. So what's that's it worth, right? It's worth the platform. Yeah. That's like when Facebook bought WhatsApp for a billion dollars, everybody was like, why would you buy a company that's 200 days old for a billion dollars? And then they bought Instagram for 200 billion. And everybody was <laughs> like, they stole WhatsApp yeah. at a billion. Yeah. Thievery for a company that was 200 days old. Assuming you believe the two hundred billion was a, a I think now violation. I think now you do because Facebook went from thirty to one hundred and thirty two dollars a share. Yeah. Because now their platform is, I mean, who's gonna who 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 is going to catch Facebook and Instagram? You know, and I think now the model for starting a business is to sell it to a big tech or sell it to Amazon. It's I'm going to build this business up with and the intent of. Yeah, when, mm -hmm. when someone takes notice of me, whether it's Amazon more in the hard product and tech over there, whether it's Facebook or whoever, mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people, that may not be the first motivation, but I think a lot of it is, uh, hey, if I'm successful, I'd sell out in a heartbeat. Mm, yeah, I mean, I don't think we live in the structure of go get a job, work there 30 years and retire. That's not it. Everybody's an entrepreneur. Yeah, there's no Thomas Edison's out there that you know want to. I mean, they may be inventors. In yeah, tech. I think we still have innovators because I still think that every day there's something new or some or, or a new way or you know data is really the highest currency on the planet now. So can you? How good can you aggregate data? How well can you create a system that helps you know Google or Amazon or Facebook to aggregate data in a way that makes them uh, more leverageable. And if you can do those things, you have a billion dollar company. 
built oh. with a B. Yeah. Because they want that ability to leverage that. They're going to make billions and the billions by leveraging something like that. And that, to me, is incredible. Well, and you think, you know, you said data is the biggest currency. I totally agree. And you look at the, the how fast it changes. You know, forever and ever and ever, it was the, the great, greatest generation. And then this generation, it was always kind of these 20-year blocks. Mm -hmm. My daughter's going to be 26 years old this year. And probably about two years ago, she was talking about this next generation is driving her crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's talking about people that are six years younger than her, yeah. eight years younger. Yeah. It's because it's the velocity of change happens so rapidly, it kind of begets itself. You know, the this tech thing, this Facebook platform then spurs the thought, oh, well, I could have an Instagram thing or, mm -hmm. you know, or WeChat or whatever. And it just, the velocity is so much quicker. Yeah, so yeah. when you think about it, like Facebook in general, when because I have young kids, right? They're like, Facebook's for old people. Oh, yeah. Instagram's for moms and dads, and TikTok's ours, so stay off of it. Yeah. That's how they feel. And, and that's they, good because I don't want to be on and it. And then they want Snapchat, but they don't want you on Snapchat. Yeah. You know what I mean? My daughter so, has two Facebook accounts. Yeah, so it's interesting. Until she quit her re yeah. the one that she cared about with her friends. Yeah. She has the family one just to let us yeah. know what's going on. But yeah. But the one, the other one's private or whatever. Yeah, for yeah. all of her buddies. No, I get it. And then she got, then they just lose interest in that because, like you said, it's for old folks yeah. anyway. So they're just on TikTok. Just, mm -hmm. yeah, now I sound like an old guy. Yeah. All they do is stare at that screen. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, kind of what we're doing today is that, right? So vertical scaling is, is what everybody's interested in now. And, you know, TikTok started it, I think, 30 second videos, and then they did three minute videos, and now they're doing 10 minute videos. Wow. On a platform that was literally how many 30 second videos can I uh, in, in consume in a day? Yeah. Now they're going to have three and 10 minute videos. That's nuts. So it's crazy. I'm proud to say I've never watched one. So, <laughs> Well, I, I do. Uh, I definitely do some research um, because as we continue to grow this business, what I'm trying to do is just establish a place that young people can come because our industry ages poorly, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to find young people and have an already established marketing platform that they can plug into uh, so that they want to be here. Because, you know, for me, what I'm, for, for when, I, when I think about legacy, right, I have a whole group of people that are under 30 right now and I've got to, I've got to mentor them and then they're going to have to hire in another group of people that are like my son's age and they're gonna to have to mentor them and be ready to step into leadership roles before I can leave. Right. Yeah. And you're you know, you gotta use the technology that they're all using. Mm -hmm. You know, I was being a little facetious, but no, I literally have never been I mean, I know what TikTok is. Yeah, of course. But but yeah, if that's what they're using and it's more than thirty seconds, it's a platform you gotta investigate. Yeah, I mean you have to yeah, you have to use it. Okay, yeah. so so shifting gears a little bit, you know, giving back, whether it be time, money, energy, effort, whatever, in the community has always been a part of my business, always. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that, you know, for-profit businesses have to have some form of philanthropy or, to me, what is the point? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What is the point of building something if you're just going to keep it all? Right. How can, what are you really giving? What are, how are you really enriching the lives of other people is a big deal to me. I know I've had discussions with your wife, Penny. I feel like she is very much a giver. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. very much a giver. So we connect <clears throat> on that very much. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about what's been a big, and not money, not amounts, nothing like that. But what's been a local one that's really been important to you guys to be involved with? I would say of all of them, it's one that Penny has been on the board of as communities and schools. Okay. And um, she put it real well. She said it's basically taking, making sure that a kid not only gets to school, because some of these kids literally are homeless, kids. Yep. I mean, a lot of times we lose sight of that. It's not just adults that are homeless, it's their children. And so it is 
getting a kid to school and getting them to a point where they can have a meal before they get to school, mm -hmm. have a pencil in hand when they get there, it is literally an altruistic thing. It is doing something because I truly care about the kids. Penny was in education for 20 years and her heart bleeds for children. And so I think that, and I watch it with her, and you know, I, she's 99% of it. You know, I get involved wherever I can, you know, give money for the, you know, be in the golf tournament or do this or that. But she is on the calls all the time and it is passion. And I think that uh, is the biggest one for, uh, for us. Uh, you mentioned local, but uh, th this one's on a national scale, but it's hugely local, hugely local in Galveston, uh, Shriners. Okay. Sh Shriners is a big deal, but it, uh, it is, uh, our daughter is a Shriners child. Uh, when we adopted her from China, she had a cleft palate and a cleft lip, and they uh, did a lot of surgeries on her. And ever since we started this business, every quarter, a percentage of our uh, profit is a check to them mm -hmm. and it's a uh, it's a running joke we go to the annual uh, donor appreciation thing yeah and the, our contact there will walk up and just say oh it's so great to see you and thank you for what you've done and I say well I think I'm about three million dollars short of what yeah. you've done yeah for us yeah you know and they, we're still paying it back yeah we're, we're yeah. just kind of paying it back yeah. it'll be 500 years but yeah you know, we'll get it paid back yeah and they kind of laugh about it, but it's, 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 that is a group that truly has zero motivation except for to help these children mm -hmm. that have been severely burned or they have issues with cleft palate or whatever the issue may be. Those are the ones that I truly like, whether it's financially or go and, you know, be there. Mm -hmm. Those probably are the two biggest ones for us. Yeah. So for me, I think, uh, so I've done, I've partnered with school districts, CCISD, which is our local school district. They're pretty, they're pretty, um, they're pretty lucky for the most part. They, they do pretty well. But even some of the stories I see come out of that, I'm, you know, like you said, you're almost blind to it until it's made aware to you what some of these kids are going through, uh, especially the ones in high school um, that are just trying to finish. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to finish COVID. It was like, how do we feed the kids? If we're not yeah. going to have school, some of them need school to eat, literally. Mm -hmm. How do we feed uh, that population of kids? So there was a point in time for me, uh, my parents had divorced, my mom was single mom, I was at home, didn't have a lot of money, um, probably close to losing the house a couple times. We ate literally the same meal every day for 14 months. Hmm. And, you know, in that spirit, uh, I appreciated things in a way I've never appreciated before. And I think kids can be extremely cruel, mm -hmm. especially if you have to get the different lunch or whatever. I don't think they should do that. Uh, so we've done lunch accounts for districts. Uh, I won't name the districts. CCISD has not needed that, but I've uh, partnered with districts to pay off negative accounts and then put some money in there so they can have normal mm. lunch line uh, so they don't have to get something different and be yeah. uh, made fun of because I think kids are pretty rude. Um, they, they're opportunistic to pick on the person that is easily picked on. And, uh, you know, I felt like I identify with that kid. So, you know, that was where some of it spawned from. And, you know, from there, we've, we've really plugged into helping veterans. That's mm -hmm. a big deal for us. And then locally, um, helping people in our industry. Our industry is not notorious for great health care. Oh, it's awful. Right. So yeah. um, trying to help people that, you know, unfortunately, every year we have one, two, three, maybe more that are fighting cancer. We do the golf tournament once mm -hmm. a year and uh, we try to pay their full deductible premium for the year while they're doing treatment so that their coinsurance can kick in and they're not out That's of pocket great. a ton. So that can be anywhere from, you know, six grand to 15 grand, depending on their insurance. Mm -hmm. But huge blessing to them because it gives them freedom to go do more treatments more you know, once you get your deductible paid you might as well go mm -hmm. uh, so instead of spacing things out they just keep rolling right um, so that's been a huge lift for us but you know I think something happens in your life that makes you want to be that way and one of the reasons that I was attracted to Penny immediately 
was that I knew I could see that in her heart. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see it immediately that she was a giver and I want to be around people like that. So, um, that's why we have such a, such a close connection. But, you know, there are a lot of business owners that do not, um, give and, uh, I don't share a lot of stuff, but I do want to have people see it and hope that that changes their mind Mm -hmm. when it comes to giving back. Like a lot of our giving is static, but having our own 501c3, most of the grants and help that we give people is um, found within our group. I'll just get an email for a grant request, like, hey, saw this person on Facebook, whatever. So we just try to find whatever that need is in the community and fill it. not looking for any credit, nothing like that, but I would like other business owners to step up and just try to do one thing a year. Find one thing and yeah. just do it. Whatever, whatever you're passionate about, you know? Mm-hmm. Whatever that one thing is, just help. Whatever that is. Uh, I, I, think, I think we could solve a lot of problems. I, I do if too. If more people would get involved. We're not, we're not gonna solve it. This isn't a bash against the government, whether you're left, right, middle, whatever, but the government's not gonna do it. Mm-hmm. because they got too much on their plate and it's too political. Mm-hmm. So we, the businesses and the people have to do it. And I think it's unfortunate that a human instinct is so many times, unless I have literally walked in that person's shoes, it's just not going to affect me. Yeah. You can't have that empathy and picture yourself in those shoes. You actually have to be in those shoes. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in the past that are adamant about not helping out that group or that group, whether it's welfare or unemployment benefits or, you know, I don't want to sound like, you know, give everything away. I'm just Mm -hmm. saying until they lost their job. And then Mm -hmm. it's, man, I wish they would have extended unemployment four more weeks, you know, but, um, but at the same time, um, you know, help the single mom, you know, I've, it's funny, I'm single mom family too, and so my mom is my hero. Yeah. You know, watch what she did. And I look at it and I just think, you know, a lot of people don't understand what it's like for that kid who's eating the same meal every single day forever. You know, you, and children don't have empathy. Mm-hmm. That, that part of their brain literally is not no, it developed. Doesn't work. Yeah. You know, till their 20s. I mean, yeah. there's studies that say until you're in your 20s, you know, it's like when your parents lecture you, why would you go and bully that kid? And they look at you like you're from Mars. Yeah. Well, what's the problem? Correct. You know, yeah. because their brain hasn't developed. Sure. So, but I wish that businesses and people mm. could put themselves in that, those shoes of those disadvantaged people, adults or children, you know? Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I was also adopted you know, I know I you have know an that. adopted daughter. Okay. So I think that that's incredible that you guys gave her that gift, number one. And then, uh, you know, I was raised by an incredibly uh, patient man. And so I tried to learn as much as I could from him. He died very young uh, from cancer, which is probably why we do the cancer golf tournament. Mm. But between him and my mom, who's also my hero, she's the single most important person in our family, mm-hmm. right? She uh, just taught us how to love unconditionally and she would have, even in that year where we ate the same thing every day for 14 months, she would have given you her bowl Yeah. if she thought you needed it. Mm-hmm. It's just the kind of person she is. So if you don't have an example in your life like that or if you've not walked it, I know it's hard, but uh, I get more out of giving than the person receiving it, 100%. Yeah, yeah, uh, so I agree. I think that if people would just give it a chance and give from the heart, they would realize that they're getting way more than they're giving up. Yeah. Every single time. Maybe maybe divert a little bit of your money you give to your favorite politician and give half of that to some needy whatever it is. person. You know, yeah, whatever. whatever it is. Just find just find something that you're somewhat passionate about and get involved on the most minute level and then make yourself uh, pay attention to the result of of the giving. If just pay attention to the result, you know? You know, anyone that has a passion that wants to really make a go at it, I feel like it's easier now than it ever has been. Mm -hmm. Access is is easy. Uh, It's cheaper to have an opportunity to start a business. You can start a business with your phone. Mm -hmm. 
There's free apps, there's free versions. If you have a good idea, you can be innovative right now. If you're passionate about something, I would say that keep working your job, commit 10 hours a week, take a risk. Um, you, you have to fail a few times to get where you wanna be. Well, I'll give you a great example mm -hmm. of how somebody could do that. Have, like you said, that side hustle. There's a company called Upwork and it's uh, upwork.com. I've used them a number of times. It is a consulting company, but it's, it's individuals literally all around the world. And you, as an example, what I do, I will put up, let's just say, a series of Excel spreadsheets. And I'll say, I want someone to create an access database out of this, because I can't do that. And I'll put all the instructions up. This is what I want. These are the reports I want. I'll stick it up there, and I get bids. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh, India, Kansas, all over the world. And I thumb through them, and I look at all their uh, resume of what they've done before. Have they done this before? And then I pick them. And that is somebody sitting in their living room in, I don't know, Pakistan or mm -hmm. Indonesia, replying to that, and that is their gig. Mm -hmm. So they're like you said, you, you couldn't do that 15, 20 years ago. There's no, no way. Mm -mm. And now you can. There's a platform for everything. That's what I was saying with access. Access is so easy now. There's access to everything. If you want, if you have a skill and you're passionate about it and you want to leverage it, today is the easiest market ever to leverage it. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you one more question and then we'll, and then we'll end it. And this is one that's really fun. Uh, and I've found that the answers are <laughs> really, really varied. But when I talk about leverage, right, you get to a point to where you own a business, you're, you're on some boards, you know, we get pulled in a lot of directions. What is one thing that you choose to leverage by paying someone else to do that your 20 year old self would have said, James, you'll never pay someone to do that. And then what's one that you keep that is probably just dumb that you keep it because the ROI is not there. <laughs> I do too much of the dumb stuff. I don't, I don't, um, um, I don't push off enough things. Yeah. I, I still do a lot of them. Yeah. But you don't cut your own hair, right? I mean, that's just, I'm just saying. I actually started doing it. No way. No, my buddy, who, who's is very, very short. He's like me, yeah. you know, losing it all. He did it. He goes, no, I do it all the time. I said, how do you get the back? Yeah. So uh, I tried it a couple times. Then Penny, now everybody's going to look at this and go, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> but Penny cleans it. Yeah. That's just more I wanted to try to do. Um, what do I... 20-year-old self would have been like, I'll never pay someone to do that. But now you're like, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't make sense from a time perspective. Oh, boy. What do I have somebody doing that my 20-year-old self... Um, God, I wish I had a really cool thing to say. Um, I don't know. You ever change your oil when you were 20? I uh, washed my car. Okay. So I'd washed it back then. I, I, I won't wash my car to save my life. Okay. I got to go and sit there and watch somebody, watch it go through a little booth, yeah. and I sit there and watch somebody yeah. clean it, but then I feel so bad I always over tip. Yeah. Because it's like I feel like they're having to do it and they're not getting paid. Yeah. You know, like I feel bad because I should be doing that. Sure. That for sure. Okay, yeah, there's, see, there's you, no doubt. Okay, so there's one. And then where's, what's one that you think that like most people have probably hired this out, but, I'm, but I don't because I enjoy it? You know, even though I occasionally get black algae, which I am fighting right now, I like to do my pool. Really? Yeah. I might try to do my pool is a nightmare. My we, wife will say at some point when she's looking at that sea of green, she goes, are you sure you don't want to pay $200 a month? And I say, no, it's the principle. And I, I know nothing about chemistry. Yeah. I, made my, I got myself out of that yeah. in, in high school. I've never taken a science, a real science. Yeah. And, but I wanted to do it. It's just a little kit, little blue kits, piece of cake. What's the pH? What's the chlorine? Piece of cake. Yeah, piece of cake, yeah. You know? then, no. it's, then I go out of town for two days, and I come back, and the whole thing's green. Yeah. But now I'm learning, and I'm finally... I'm going to do a shameless plug, Leslie's Pool Supplies. Yeah. They actually walk me through it all. Yeah. And I, I follow my little sheet, and I do it. It's too like, high, wow. put base. Too low, put acid, whatever. Well, and then, of course, buy this product and that product sure. and that product. Stabilizers. And yeah. yeah. All these things I've never heard of. I would never. I would never. We tried to do it for a month. I said, no, 
Well, no the choice. funny thing is, so no chance. so I had green algae all over the place, and so I go get the green algae killer, and I'd work on that, and four days later it's gone to reveal the black algae underneath. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm fighting that now. But, yeah. Well, yeah. I, 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 I just think that's a fun conversation because when we do talk about leverage, I know people that leverage everything, and then I know people that leverage nothing. Oh, I know one. What? I'll speak for Penny. Okay. And I, I, I support it. I don't want her to go, wait, why would you say that? Shipped. Oh, yeah. The grocery people. Yeah. It's like, we can't get off our couch and go get groceries. I mean, that's in our mind, but sure. it's like, okay, after 80 hours a week, you know, can't we have a little bit of luxury, like someone else will bring our groceries over? Mm -hmm. But that, you look at that and go, seriously? What you, an incredible business, though. Oh, yeah. How would that become a business? We'll just pick your groceries up for you. Yeah. Is there anything therapeutic about going to the grocery store? It is not for me. I will spend four times the money yeah. than if I do a shipped order. It is so much easier for me to say, oh, hey, Penny, I'll swing by the grocery store on the way home until I actually have to swing by the grocery store sure. on the way home. It's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. And so I love it. I'll pay the extra money for that. But, yeah, that's something I would look back at. 20, I'd go... What do you think? You're a millionaire? Yeah, 20 year old. Got, what do you, have got some valet doing yeah. here? Yeah, 20 year old self would be like, you're paying someone to go down the aisles and shop for your groceries. What a snob. Yeah. Did you have someone put your jacket on too? Yeah, but now it's like, of course I do that. Yeah. I mean, the, the return is so high. Why would I go to the grocery store? Yeah, I will never mow my lawn because I would never, I'd do it three times. I'd be so excited. I'd look at it. I'd be so happy with how I did it. Then I'd get busy. And I'd never keep the blades up. I'd never sharpen them and do all that stuff. And, and then I'd go out of town and the grass would get so high. I went out of town one time, I'll never forget. I'm mowing my lawn, I'm taking care of it myself, my young self, we were newly married. Yeah. And we go, we, we got that $11,000 I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, down payment on a car and? Bought a Grand Cherokee. Okay. Drove from Houston to Florida okay. and the day before I left, my next door neighbor said, you know, the summer's, you know, summer's getting here. You really need to fertilize your lawn. So the last thing I did before I left town is I fertilized my lawn. Didn't water it. And didn't water it oh. for 10 days. Came back and I had Fried. no lawn. I had no lawn. Yeah. And then I called the, you know, I called the True, True Green, green yeah. and, you know, and, and Terminate or whatever. The other yeah. people that get all the insects out. And I don't think I've ever done my lawn ever again. Yeah. So my issue is, is I, anything that I decide I'm going to do, like if I said, oh, you know what, I'll just keep my lawn. So I, you know, I don't do my, I don't do my lawn. I don't do my pool. Uh, I think those are pretty normal, but <clears throat> I also, we pay someone to do our dinners. Really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. We, we eat a little better. So do they, they don't like come in your house and cook it. Mm -mm, they no. They bring no. it to you. Yeah. We just pick them up. Interesting. Yeah. So Monday through Friday dinners, we don't have to think about what to cook. We don't have to spend the time doing it. We probably eat a little better, and we actually spend time eating with our kids versus just getting whatever. Um, so that's something I never would have thought. So theoretically, if at Grand Oak Village, mm -hmm. walking distance from where your building will mm -hmm. be, there was a business that made pre-prepared meals. Oh yeah, I would, they would get my business for sure. Okay, I'll, because let, him, I'll that, let him know that. I am that type of client. I, I, I understand the return on that time is high for me. Yeah. I don't have to think about what to cook. I don't have to do the additional groceries. I don't have to spend time preparing it. My wife doesn't have to spend time preparing it. And I get to sit down and eat with my kids. Yeah. Pretty much stress-free. Uh, so that is something that um, I never thought I would pay somebody to do, but I really enjoy the return on that leverage. Well, go the extra mile and eat on paper plates and you don't have to clean the dishes <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, well, Save that time. Yeah. Anybody that has kids has bought paper plates, I'm sure. But oh, yeah. I, uh, and, then the, and then the other one is, for me, it's not a singular thing, but <clears throat> I'll just pick a project or two every year, and I'm like, I'm going to do that. Mm. Even if it would have cost... Oh, I do that all the time. Minimal. I just never do it. I changed out my garage door opener, and it took me four hours on a Saturday. My time is probably worth way more than that. Whoever would have put that in would have charged me way less yeah. than my time times four hours. But I just wanted to do it. No, you're a way better man than me. I can't fix anything. 
I mean, I literally tried to change a light bulb once and I screwed up our ceiling fan because I, I, I broke it off. Too far. <clears throat> I, I yeah. broke it off too far and then I went, I actually turned off the breaker. I'm mm -hmm. smart enough to do that. And I took needle nose pliers. I actually pulled out the inner casing oh. instead of the light bulb you fixture. You a potato. Yeah. So I'm not real. Yeah, that garage door opener, I want to put it in backwards. Yeah. But it would be hanging off the ceiling. Yeah, but I'll pick something randomly like that needs to be done. And I'm like, oh, I could do that. And it'll take me four times as long as a professional because I'm a perfectionist. And it's not what I do for a living. And when I do go to use my tools, I don't know where they are. Oh, yeah. Mine are all because rusty. Because whatever the last project was, they all went into a bag, and then I might need those tools, I might need something else. Yeah. So, But that's good. You grow by doing something, and that's why it's so satisfying. Yeah. I'll Four try hours. to make my son help me, too, for part of it. Like, come hold this or do this or whatever, you know? So he's not thrilled about it now, but years later he'll be telling the story. Sure. Well, so my dad, me and my dad put in our own garage door opener one time. No, not really. I helped my dad, you know, I helped, I steered him, you know, the right way. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. made sure he didn't get the wrong wrench or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I yeah. like that. And then uh, how many ballparks have you and your daughter went to? Ah, uh, that's my favorite story. Yeah. I think this year, Seattle, which was last month, was our 18th. Okay. So we've been going every year to a different ballpark. Are you hitting... When they get a new stadium, do you have to go to the new one too? Or do you we just, recognize. Or do you just check it off for that team? No, you can't check it off. Okay. You can't do that. Like case in point, she went to the Rangers ballpark, yeah. the second one of three. The yeah. very first one was the old, yeah. like bench metal seats way back in the day. And then ballpark at Arlington. Ballpark at Arlington. Now, and now Globe Field, yeah. maybe. Um, and but we went to the one in between. But she hasn't been to the new one, and she's been to Bush three, but not Bush two or one. Okay. Uh, I've been to Seattle one. She just went to the brand new one. But we've been um, we're saving California to the end, and thank God I went to Gonna the do Dodgers before. I don't want to go to oh, the yeah. Dodgers Stadium wearing my Astros gear. Yeah. Oh no. But our last one will most likely be uh, San Francisco. Okay. Because it's supposed to be the best of them all. Okay. But we've gone. Are you going to go in or rent the kayak? I've, I think we'll do two days, and we do that every once in a okay. while. And uh, McCovey's Cove, yeah. out in the water. Yeah. And she, we love to kayak. When we went to Milwaukee two years ago, we kayaked through the city. What we do is, in addition to the actual ballpark, yeah. we explore the city. Yeah. And it's all about that bonding. Penny's not allowed yeah. because she's, she'll take over the whole thing, yeah. and then she'll start lecturing Emma. Mm -hmm. And Emma likes it because, you know, I'll just kind of. Um, it's just fun. It's just fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but it's a, it's a neat thing for us to do. It was really, really important as she was becoming a teen and all mm -hmm. that. And don't get me wrong, there were times where at the end of the three or four day trip when she was a teenager, need, I thought, y'all need a break. I think we're about done with this whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she was saying the same. All he does is tell me to pick up this and go to bed and it's time to get up. And, yeah. But She's then, come back around now. Now, where it is, it's so funny. She feels like I'm old and feeble. And so she'll say, well, okay, Dad, we're going to Detroit. We've got a layover in Nashville, and we're going to have to get another plane. And I'm thinking, yeah, for my 700 flight in my life, I think Should I be got fine. that. I think I'll, I'll be good. Yeah. But I just go, oh, okay. And Penny always harps it on me. She goes, don't challenge her on it. Just say okay. She wants to feel good that she's now taking care of you. Yeah. We walked up, we went to Utah, and we hiked. Went up this pretty darn treacherous thing called Angel's Landing or something. Okay. And, um, and you're holding a chain, single file, as you're going up. And, like, it, literally, if you fall, you're dead. Yeah. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm just waiting to kind of move up fast. And Emma's in front of me, and every once she'll, she'll look down and go, Dad, are you Okay. And what I want to say is if you'd speed up, I'd be really yeah, okay. I'd be done, yeah. But I just go, no, 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 I'm good. So, um, but it's been a really cool bonding experience. And we went to Fenway and its 100th anniversary. And we've gone to a lot of the uh, really neat stadiums. But now we're kind of, now because she's an adult, she's got money, she's an attorney, she can go do things on her own. I'm taking her to the last spots that she would probably never think about for a vacation okay she's not going to go wow i'd like to go to minnesota yeah or milwaukee 
or Pittsburgh. Um, Cleveland. Have you all been to Philadelphia? That's where we're going this next year. Okay. We uh, tons of history. Oh my gosh, I've been y'all there with Penny. Been, y'all already went to the National Stadium. Uh, that was one of my favorites, yeah. actually. Kansas City is her favorite of okay. all of them. My favorite's Wrigley, just because okay. it's history. Wrigley. It's they the didn't history. even play a, a night game until '96 or something. Yeah, it was it, it, it was, was pretty wild late. for yeah. sure. But um, then we've you know we've got I could do a whole segment on all yeah. the stories, but you know just so many different stories, but. It's just it's just fun going with her, and that's um, you know she feels like that's you know her best part of the year, and I feel that's my best part of the year. And then Penny have our own, and I have our own deals, and she and Penny have their bonding stuff, and but it's a neat it's a neat deal. I'll I tell you what would be cool piggybacking off of that is, and and we could we could partner on it or I could do it. That's fine, but wouldn't it be cool to? give a grant for someone to take their kid to a ballpark. Ooh, that's neat. I like that. Yeah. I'd partner with you on yeah. that for sure. See, there you go. Done. We'll end it right there. Done. Tell me tell me when. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Awesome. It works.